Two guests today. First of all, Royce White. He is a former, as an NBA and college football star who is now running for Senate in Minnesota. He's running against Amy Klobuchar, and he's here to talk about uh, what has informed his vision for the country and his theme, which is is thoroughly embraced by uh, probably most of us, uh, certainly me, uh, is not letting the elites divide us by telling us what to think of each other. That is a monumental theme. It is, I would say, a uh, noble theme and one that I support wholeheartedly. We're also going to get a quick visit, maybe not so quick, uh, from Paul Alexander. He wants to come back and set some records straight. And he, uh, I talked to him before coming in here, and he said it's going to be a big interview. So I look forward to that as well. So stay with us. Our laws, as it pertains to substances, are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Are you one of the millions of American women and men dealing with premature hair thinning and hair loss? Or maybe you're scared about inheriting that thinning look because it runs in your family? Start 2024 with a real solution that delivers results without the harsh side effects or unwanted chemicals and no need for prescription. Provia uses a safe natural ingredient, Procapil, to effectively target the three main causes of premature hair thinning and hair loss. By supporting healthy scalp circulation, the delivery of nourishing nutrients, and healthy hair follicle anchoring to your scalp, Provia guarantees more hair on your head than in the shower or on your comb. Right now, new customers save over 50% plus free shipping. Every introductory package includes a full 60-day supply of Provia serum for daily use, plus the Provia Super Concentrate for faster, more noticeable results. Don't wait. Order now to save an extra 10% and get free shipping at ProviaHair.com forward slash Drew. That's P-R-O-V-I-A-H-A-I-R, ProviaHair.com slash D-R-E-W. I think everyone knows the next medical crisis could be just around the corner, whether it comes in the form of another pandemic or something much more routine like a tick bite. You and your family need to be prepared. That's where the wellness company comes in. You know the wellness company. We have their physicians on like Dr. McCullough frequently. The wellness company and their doctors are medical professionals you can trust. And their new medical emergency kits are the gold standard when it comes to keeping you safe and healthy. It's really, it's a safety net. It's an insurance policy yeah, absolutely. that you hope you're not going to need. But if you need it, you sure as heck are going to wish you had it if you need it. Be ready for anything. This medical emergency kit contains an assortment of life-saving medications, including ivermectin, z pack the medical emergency kit provides a guidebook to aid in the safe use of all these life-saving medications. From anthrax to tick bites to COVID-19, the wellness company's medical emergency kit is exactly what you need to have on hand to be prepared. Rest assured, knowing that you have emergency antibiotics, antivirals, and antiparasitics on hand to help you and your family stay safe from whatever life throws at you next. Go to drdrew.com slash TWC. That is D-R-D-R-E-W dot com forward slash T-W-C to get 10% off today. Just click on that link. And as I said, Paul Alexander will be joining me a bit later. He is also serving as I am on the board with uh, the wellness company. And look forward to other kits coming down the road. Some of them you'll be able to get through my website. I'm really very excited about that. But right now we're going to welcome in just a second Royce White. I want to give you all the places you can go to find him and support him. As far as his Senate run, it is White, excuse me, Royce, spelled R O Y C E, RoyceWhite.us. Uh, let's see, were you going to put something else up there, Caleb? On X, it is at highway underscore 30. In uh, YouTube, the podcast is at Please Call Me Crazy Podcast, which I, I love the name of that podcast. And we're going to hear more about that in a second. And as I said uh, before the break, Royce's umbrella theme that I am very excited about is not letting elites divide us, not telling us what to think, what to think of each other. It's just a very noble theme, it seems to me. Please welcome Royce White. How you doing, man? And there you are. 
I'm great. Thank you for joining us, Royce. So t t I want you to dig into, I got a lot of stuff I want to talk to you about, but I, first what's on my mind obviously is this theme about the elites getting, you know, and, and the media not doing anything to uh, to challenge the elites. In fact, in fact, amplifying this division. What, what are your thoughts on this? And what are you going to do about it as a senator? Well, I think we've been divided since World War II. Um, and, and, you know, th that was more political and economic with some of the restructuring that took place after World War II, but then it carried on with the civil rights movement. And, you know, as a black man who grew up in Minnesota, come from a Democrat community, a culturally Democrat community, although I was born and raised Catholic, you know, all the, uh, the wakes and weddings were at the Catholic church. Um, it, it seems that the black identity is, is sort of the linchpin of, um, of division, uh, political division here in our country uh, in a number of ways. Uh, one, the expansion of the federal government, for sure, is you know, black people are kind of the, the, the theme, the scam, let's say, not a theme, the scam in the black community is we have to continue to expand the federal government or we'll be the victims of white supremacy, which I reject on face value. It's not an, uh, it's not an American way to think about your citizenship, but, but also other things as well. So, um, you know, it, it's, I don't mean to make it racial, but we do have to deal with the way the narrative has been being driven. And, and black people are certainly uh, the, the, the cornerstone or, or one of the lead um, tools of the, of the machine to keep us divided. And, and mostly it's to say something even more pernicious is like our founding fathers. I was thinking about this the other day with, with you know, Martin Luther King Day. And I saw some people were critical of Martin Luther King and whatnot. We can talk about that if, if, if you want to. But it just got me to thinking uh, once again that you know, th this pitch that we should give our citizenship up because our founding fathers owned slaves or because our founding fathers had, uh, you know, s certain uh, racial superiority, uh, you know, ideas or whatever the case may be. I'm not giving up my freedom of speech or my right to bear arms because of this nation's past or other people's mistakes. The ideas are too good. Uh, and I think a lot of black people are yeah. waking up to that and other minorities are waking up to that all around the country. And, and I'm excited to be a part of it, especially here in Minnesota, which I call the belly of the beast because, the, you know, after the George Floyd thing uh, situation happened, Minnesota's ground zero for all of the, the identity politics. So. Yeah, and it's certainly we would need a leader. I mean, you sort of fit the profile of someone that could help us navigate our way out of this, it seems to me. I. I, I just I welcome you to this to this cause I, only for good only for good for everybody to raise all the boats that we should all thrive as as citizens of this country. I I don't know I I um I you know you 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 mentioned the white supremacy thing and and I do believe well let me put it this way uh, have you have you read some of the speeches of Frederick Douglass have you want, looked at his Absolutely. words. Because I really, Absolutely. okay, I really feel like his thinking, his words have tremendous value in our present moment. And, and one of the things he spoke about that broke through some of my own personal denial was sort of Eurocentric, white-centric ways of thinking and seeing the world. And, uh, and I, he really, his words really got me to step outside of myself and look through, through new pair of glasses, essentially. Now, it wasn't a drastic different view of the world, but it, 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 he required me to watch myself, to check myself, make sure I'm not seeing it just... And I would argue that that's a great percept way to check yourself, no matter what we're talking about, whether it's as a male or as a father or as an older guy or, yeah. or, as, you know, or as a boomer, whatever it is, check yourself. Check, check what your perceptions are that might be colored and what somebody else's experience might be. It's that simple. And he really asked us to do that in, with his eloquence that, man, it just sure broke through to me. And so I, I, I feel like those are the kinds of words we, we need in the present moment. Well, yeah, well first off, <clears throat> Frederick Douglass is one of the most underutilized icons in American history for the Republican Party or the conservative movement. Um, and, and to what end, I'm not quite sure. I, I think that the lack of use of Frederick Douglass is, is so negli negligent you can, you, it, it's, it's hard to it's convince negligent. me it's not intentional. It's, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it's hard negligent. to convince me You're it's right. not intentional. You, yeah. It's, it's dumb. It's dumb. It's negligent and dumb, <laughs> frankly. Uh, yeah. But, I, but no, even, please bring even, it back. It, bring, bring it front and center. Bring him out. We need him. I mean, we need that man. Even, even more so too, and I'll say this, um, 
when I think of the European centric mindset, I don't so much think of it as a black versus white thing or, or a, a person being white. My grandmother was a first generation immigrant from Norway. My other grandmother was a first generation immigrant from Mexico. And then obviously I have black uh, ancestry that came by way of the slave trade and things like that. So uh, I, I, I grew up with, with different perspectives anyway, and I'm, I'm fortunate in that way. But, but I don't even think about the, the Frederick Douglass piece with Eurocentric thinking about black versus white. I think about it in terms of citizenship, which I think is most important. And I think many of our elites, mm. the elites that I was, the, the elites I was referencing, um, we are, are plagued in America by a sort of uh, a remnant of this Atlanticist mentality. And, and, you know, we are not European. Americans are not European, but even more importantly, white people in America are not European. And we need to make that distinction. Uh, and, and and you see right now, even in our, um, you know, our, our obsession with defeating the Russians, I mean, the, the war between the Russians and the Brits goes back to the, the early 1800s. It goes back even earlier than that. This is the great game between Russia and the, and the British Empire. And in our interests, yeah. no matter how many people want to tell you, are, are tied up in it. Uh, I think Donald Trump did great to say, hey, we got to look, we got to evaluate what's going on with this NATO deal. And if... Okay, even if these are our allies, even if there's a commonwealth, even if we are, are, are allied because of common language or, or, or heritage or cultural values or the, the Westphalian nation state or whatever you want to say, uh, Europe has to kick in. They have to pay their weight. We, we can no longer allow the Europeans to piggyback off of the working class here in America. Um, and, and some of our elites just don't get that. I mean, they're obsessed with this Atlanticist European identity. Who, who are those people? Are they the sort of neocons? Are they, is it just a cultural vestige? Uh, is it, is there, I, I worry about people's palms being greased the way, the way, what I've learned about the sort of encumbrances of our government these days. Yeah, well, well, number one, I think, I think Davos, Switzerland right now is probably the neural cortex of the beast. I, I call Minneapolis the belly of the beast. Uh, Davos is the neural oof. cortex. They're the, they're the brain trust of the whole deal. Uh, and, you know, and Klaus, you know, you're talking about a guy who came from a Swiss engineer that helped the Nazis make bombs. And so, you know, this whole history, the thing that's strange about it is the reason why I decided to run is because I'm offended that our elites think that the common American citizen is so dumb. And it's not that they think we're yeah. dumb. It's that they think that the high they've created with technology and whatever else is, is so good that we just won't pay attention to the details. So I want to call people's focus to those details. And if we're going to be European, we at least have to consider the European history. And people have no clue what went on there in Europe and how we arrived at this place That's where right. we, we defend Europe right. with this sort of cultural obsession. So, you know, it's, um, it's a lot of people in Europe uh, and it's a lot of people here, the neocons for sure. But, but there's a lot of that Atlanticist uh, framework still at play. You know, what's interesting as I was listening to you speak, I, I, I was reflecting on my own heritage, which is uh, my father's family uh, making it out just before the Holodomor in the Ukraine. And the interesting thing about their escape, first of all, then they all called themselves Russians. I always thought I was Russian descent. Turns out Ukrainian, Belarusian, which is apparently a common part of that diaspora. But they all don't want to talk about Europe. They want to talk about what they're able to do here. It was a very can-do group. This is, they were so grateful and they they, they didn't want, they didn't want to be associated not with Eastern Europe, but they wanted to get on with the culture and the opportunities and the ideas that this country was founded on. They weren't looking back. They, in fact, they would never ever talk about it. For me, just as a, a side note, my, my heritage was obscured for most of my life because they just wouldn't talk about it. And not a lot of it was traumatic, but they just no moving on. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, the, the 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 most interesting history, the most interesting thing is to see, and I have very uh, deep deep ties to the Jewish community here in Minnesota, and we have a, a prominent Jewish community, and um, obviously there is a rise in anti-Semitism, especially on the right, and I I see it, and I'm um shocked by it, concerned by it, and. You know, any number of narratives that are working in order to, to, to keep people divided yet again, whether it's the black identity or the yeah. Jewish identity, there's a similarity between the two. Um, but, but one of the stories, like I was saying, from this European history and, and with the Ukraine in, in mind is, 
is, is like we forget that the Ukrainians, when the Nazis marched across Ukraine into Russia, that the Ukrainians, many Ukrainians, not the Jewish Ukrainians, but the, 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 the native Ukrainians, uh, joined the Nazis. They threw the swastikas on. And some of the most, some mm -hmm. of the most you know, tragic uh, you know, killings of the Jewish people happened there in Ukraine during World War II. I think a million yeah. Jews maybe were killed oh, yeah. in just the Ukraine. Um, so, you know, these are the histories that we, I don't, I don't, I don't quite know how they've been forgotten, but I do know that the mainstream media does a great job not to, not to talk about them. And that's, that's scary. So tell me a little bit about your experience in the NBA. <clears throat> and I, I, the call me crazy podcast uh, fascinates yeah. me. And, uh, I'm guessing you had some symptomatology and, and I read briefly that anxiety was a, a feature and I will just share with you as, as a way of uh, opening the doors. I have generalized anxiety disorder. I had severe anxiety with panic and a pretty good depression, I would say, when I was like 19, 20, 21. So I'm very familiar with the experience of anxiety. And I, my flavor is sort of in the OCD zone of anxiety. There's different kinds of anxiety. I, there's some that overlaps with OCD. And I, I had, the OCD stuff's never bothered me. I've actually been able to use it as an asset. But that's definitely me. So, uh, welcome, sir. Uh, join the club. Yeah. Well, you know, the anxiety, for, for first off, <clears throat> when I came into the NBA in 2012, 2013, <clears throat> um, there wasn't a single mention of mental health in our entire collective bargaining agreement. So, you know, my, my, my fight with the NBA was about policy. And, and you could say that I've been involved in politics and policy aspect of politics since my, my being drafted in the NBA. Um, and, you know, it, to me, it was, well, how do we have a banned substance list? And that's really the only acknowledgement of, of the human mind as an integral part of, of the overall, you know, overall health, uh, comprehensive health or, or the human condition. And it, it wasn't by accident. And, and that was my problem with the entire thing. I looked at a banned substance list that had uh, benzodiazepines, which are very addictive. Obviously, I was prescribed them for flying. I had anxiety, uh, panic around uh, flying. Uh, and now we see they're going to try and make a woke push to, to change the, the workforce of, of the FAA, which maybe my, my uh, flight anxiety was, was premonition. But um, yeah, I, 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 I looked <laughs> at the banned substance list and I thought to myself, well, all of this is reactive. None of it's proactive. And, and especially in a, a, a corporation like the NBA that has all of the tools to be proactive, especially when their players' mental health would actually benefit the product and it would actually benefit them monetarily, I, I couldn't help but ask myself why. And so I fought the NBA on, on mm -hmm. mental health policy. Now, three years later, they would institute many of the policies that I, that I advocated for. Some of them I even wrote myself. Um, but but I continued to be, you know, kind of exiled from from any opportunity to play in the NBA because of that fight. And and the mainstream media shield for wow. the NBA. They covered. They covered for him. Oh, the mainstream media, huh. CNN, CBS, USA Today, the New York Times, you name them. They just covered for the NBA. They said they, they painted the story of here's a guy who's a prima donna. He's asking for too much special treatment. And for that reason, it only makes sense that none of these NBA owners will, will take on the, the challenge or the hassle of accommodating him. And all I was saying is, mm. can, we get, can we get some acknowledgement that mental health is a, a relative aspect of overall health in our document, in our bargaining agreement? You know what's odd to me is uh, I, I smell the work of agents afoot here <laughs> because about 20, let me think when this was, in the in the nineties, how long is it? <laughs> twenty five years ago. Uh, listen, yeah, twenty five years ago, I did work with the NBA. Uh, I was doing some addiction treatment, and they were referring people to my program and things. And at that point, they had a centralized system of mental health out of Atlanta with a very fine psychiatrist and his wife at the head. And I was blown away by the quality of what they were doing then is that just all dismantled and gone well I, i'm not sure about the program um that was that was well before my time but but all i know is when i got there there was a sort of deer in the headlights attitude about mental health in general nobody it, it got so crazy i'll give you an no, example it's, it's different i asked to be different. able to it wasn't like I, that I asked, wasn't 
wasn't I, like that. I asked to I asked to be able to 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 mitigate the amount of um, benzodiazepines I would take over the course of a year. I asked to be able to mm. drive whenever possible, whenever the 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 whenever the schedule permitted me to. For example, if we were going from Chicago to Milwaukee, mm -hmm. just let me take the four hour drive. I, I you know it's no problem. I have no problem taking the long way to for to benefit my health and and whatnot. But something I heard back from the NBA office was uh, the team covering the cost of your travel could be considered a salary cap infringement come free agency. And, you know, yeah. these, so it was more of a policy yeah. slash agent slash yeah. contract slash fight between the union and the, in the league or, or, you know, some, you know, and I was just like, guys, this is the problem in America. And people may look at it and go, well, what do we care about the NBA? The NBA is, you know, the entertainment league. It's guys playing basketball. No, the NBA are your lobbyists. The NBA are the titans of industry that set the corporate culture in this country. And that corporate culture is mm -hmm. overly litigious. It's, it's, it's overly uh, concerned with, with profit, uh, you know. And so these are mm -hmm. the, you know, Pfizer's and all that. They all work together. It's one corporate watering hole. Uh, and I got a firsthand look at it. I was fortunate to get a firsthand look at it at a young age, which can now help me, uh, uh, you know, in my, in my political work. Yeah, that's awful. I'm sorry that happened. Uh, and yes, I think your anxiety was uh, your body telling you something about the future. Now you'll be taking a train to Washington from uh, from Minnesota, from Minneapolis yeah, to, to do your job. But uh, let's bring back the old Teddy Roosevelt, uh, you know, run, train rides. Well, hey, we'll have you speaking out of the back of the train. It'd be so funny. Um, yeah, that's a shame to hear that. And I, 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 more than I want to get into, but I had a run in with the... Um, the baseball players union and agents uh, around that same time and were shocked at how you couldn't even mention mental health or substance abuse without the unions and the agents going berserk and people were hurt because that harmed severely. So I, I smell the same thing af afoot here. I, the other thing you mentioned, the, the cozy relationship between corporate world and regulators and government and media yeah. th that is the definition of and and i don't mean to say this to be um provocative it just happens to be the definition of fascism which is a corporate government union that's what that is it, it's it it yes. tends towards totalitarianism which is another element in it but the fascism itself is government corporate union speak to that yes. Corporatocracy, yeah, absolutely. I was, I was saying it then. I was saying, look, you know, everybody's going. Well, you know, I just like to go to the games and and you know get away from, detach from all of my problems. And I have a team. I'm a fan. You know, I just drink the beer, and it's all a good time. And and I and I, I was I, look. I grew up in the '90s in in the Bulls era. I mean, Michael Jordan is is an icon. He's a mm. he was the greatest thing to ever mm. watch coming up as a kid born in '91. Obviously, right. And so. You know, I love the game of basketball dearly, but but we can't overlook the political and social implications. And, and the implication is here we have all of these corporations that have obscene amounts of influence on, on the everyday lives of the working class. These are your political, scientific, managerial elite, and, and they're going to give orders down from on high. And, and my whole thing is, if you're going to give orders from on high, they better be righteous. They better be uh, on the up and up, and they better be, at least be detailed. And what I found is there's a radical incompetence and an arrogance in the incompetence where there isn't malice. And I'm not saying that there's not malice, that they're all doing it by mistake, because th that's not true. But, but I just found that there's a level of arrogance in some of these people like, of course, we know what we're doing. We went to Northwestern or we went to, you know, uh, what, you know wherever, you know, and, and, you know, I went to, uh, you know, Wofford or wherever it is, you know, and it's just like, you should believe me because I'm educated. And I'm like, um, okay, well, tell me why there's not one mention of mental health in, a, in a, an entire collective bargain agreement. Do you deny this area of science? Are you saying that mental health <laughs> is not a legitimate area of, of scientific research? Well, how is that possible? Because all, all of your work and partnership with social media and big tech suggest that you know exactly how the human psychology works and you plan to exploit it.
You know, it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm ha- having echoes. I'm having memories now of speaking to the psychiatrist who was the head of the NBA's program at the time. Great guy. Uh, mm-hmm. And he was saying, hey, he goes, look, he goes, we are taking these kids sometimes out of high school, definitely out of college, and we're turning them overnight into millionaires. And we are not preparing them in any way for any of this. And what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> so what, and they, they have needs. We should be proactive. We should be get trauma therapies. We should be doing financial education. I just they, He had lots of ideas. And I thought, wow, the NBA is doing a great job. And uh, that was in the mid-90s. You, know, you were four years old. I, I guess it's all been dismantled since then, or at least interfered with by, as you're saying, fear of, of uh, legal action and that kind of stuff. And the unions and all that business go ahead yeah no i mean the lead the look and it's not just the nba i mean I, my story comes from the nba so I'm, I'm using the nba as an example but it's america's corporate culture writ large and in, in many ways it's become america's political culture and and that's the real that's mm-hmm. the real connect that's the real canary in the coal mine it's not about my career it's not about the nba players who make millions of dollars to play a game. Uh, that's just that's just an example. The real problem is they are no different in the way they treat the American working class or the working poor, as as with the deplorables, as Hillary Clinton would would say. But um, you know, th- this has become this has become the modus operandi of of our political elites, and they'll use division to keep you off the scent, so that you don't understand and and, and identify exactly what they're doing. That's really interesting. So here's what I want to do. I'm, I want to take a little break, and then I want you to come back and talk about a little more specifics. I mean, wh- what do you want to do about this? Give us your, you know, your pitch to get people to vote for you, whatever, wh- however you present that. Um, you know, your your uh, your dignity and your smarts speak for themselves. But let's get into the weeds a little bit about what you're going to do. All right. 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 All right, Rice White, everybody. Follow him at RiceWatt.us, I believe. And um, so you're seeing some of the comments that people are, are throwing up. Yes, uh, he's not just, he's just, I like this way. You're not just smart and rational, you're insightful and calm. They like the calm too. No bullshit. That's Royce. That's all, yeah, that's accurate. All right, we'll get to, uh, to more after this little break. More with Rice White and then Paul Alexander coming in a little bit later after this. Ladies and gentlemen, let's make a resolution that's easy to keep and delivers immediately on its promise. With GenuCell Skin Care, you can turn back the clock and look 5, 10, even 15 years younger. And right now, GenuCell Skin Care is celebrating 2024 with its New Year's sales event. Save over 60% off all of our favorite GenuCell products with one of our customized skin care routine packages. Say goodbye to those fine lines in the forehead and run your corner of your eyes. Sagging jawline, dark marks, skin redness, even under eye bags. Leave them in 2023. GenuCell works for women and men. It's Safe for all skin types and perfect for skin of any age. Plus, with its immediate effects, GenuCell promises results that will make you smile. Guaranteed or 100% of your money back. Start your new year look off right with one of our custom GenuCell skincare bundles right now at GenuCell.com slash Drew. Use our special code Drew at checkout for extra savings off your order today. And remember, every order place is automatically upgraded to free shipping. Don't wait. That is genucel.com forward slash Drew, G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash D-R-E-W. Well, most of my career, I've been urging people to kick habits, change habits. Well, this time, I'd like to suggest getting into the habit of adding Paleo Valley grass-fed bone broth protein to your daily nutrition regimen. Here's CEO Autumn Smith. It's made from cows with 100% grass-fed and finished and bones. They're bones rather than the hide most Bone broth or collagen powders are made from hides or hooves, but ours is actually made from the bone because it'll contain additional nutrients. Bone broth is a way to bring back those nutrients, those minerals, and there's glucosaminoglycans, and then there's collagen, which helps us prevent wrinkles and joint pain and actually heals our gut. There's, There's gelatin, and there's just all of these ingredients that the modern diet has kind of left by the wayside. Susan and I have been mixing the chocolate favorite bone broth literally into our coffee every morning for months. And we've noticed a difference in our energy, appearance of our hair, skin, nails. Susan's particularly very happy with this. The bioavailable protein also helps us feel satiated. That's the part I'm happy with. Paleo Valley bone broth also comes in vanilla and pure unflavored and can easily be added to your coffee, smoothies, yogurt. Go to drdrew.com slash paleo, P-A-L-E-O, for 15% off your first order, 
Again, that is drdrew.com slash paleo. We all know the value of a good night's sleep. We feel better, look better, have more energy to spare, but you could be missing out on all of those benefits if you're sleeping on sheets that are too hot or too cold or just plain uncomfortable. I have the solution. Cozy Earth Bedding. Cozy Earth is the softest and most comfortable sheets, blankets, loungewear, and more. They use premium viscose from highly sustainable bamboo, and we sleep in them regularly. I wear their t-shirts. Susan wears their pajamas. Cozy Earth Bedding comes with a 100-night sleep trial, which means you have up to 100 nights to sleep on them, wash them, try them out. If you're not in love, just return them within 100 days for a full refund. Susan and I love them. In fact, we have Cozy Earth sheets on our bed right now, and they made a huge difference in our sleep. If you've never tried Cozy Earth, we have some awesome news. You can save up to 35% off Cozy Earth right now. But hurry, this offer will not last. Go to CozyEarth.com, enter my promo code DREW at checkout for up to 35% off on your first order. That is CozyEarth.com, promo code DREW, C-O-Z-Y-E-A-R-T-H, CozyEarth.com, code D-R-E-W. And we are back with Royce White. Royce, uh, tell us before we get into the uh, campaign promises, let's get into the uh, Call Me Crazy podcast a little bit. What are people going to hear there? Well, I use a lot of profanity. Uh, I'll tell you that. Um, and, I, and I forward <laughs> some, some, some crazy ideas, uh, you could say. No, I, I mean, I, as somebody who's been called crazy by the mainstream media, and I was called crazy before that, you could say, because I dealt with anxiety disorder and people are often, you know, considered loony if they have any mental health condition whatsoever. So it was it was just tongue in cheek. But, you know, I, I came from the playing in the big three before I started the podcast and I talked about gain of function. I talked about, you know, JFK's assassination and all of these things that are considered conspiracy theory. Now we're seeing some of them turn out to be more true than we we would have ever hoped. Um, so, you know, that that's just the, the the plight of people who tell the truth these days to be called crazy. For a period of time until until the truth surfaces, so we 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 embrace it at, at uh, you know in, in my podcast. Yeah, keep a keep a list of all the things that you've talked about that, that turned out to be true. I mean, I I wish I had. There's been more things than I can think of in a single sitting. It's it's become kind of uncanny. I've started reading books on propaganda and how to resist persuasion and how people use persuasion. Not not something I really wanted to spend my time doing, but that's the world we live in now. Yeah, no doubt, absolutely. Um, and and you know the 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 from the from a Senate from a political standpoint and, and the Senate the Senate campaign, um, I'm an America first or through and through. I mean, I really think that there's something sane and, and logical and rational about the America first policy approach. Uh, not that we want to be isolationists, but we, we better get a lot of things in order. Uh, and, and so there, there are three crisis elements I think we have to address first. Number one, the national debt. And we, we don't want to be served to some international banking cartel or the Federal Reserve or, or the guys on Wall Street or whatever mm -hmm. deal they have brewing between each other. We don't, we don't want to be subject to the, 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 you know, the World Bank or, or whoever these posh financial elites are. We don't want to be serfs. So the national debt is something we have to deal with. The border obviously is a no brainer. We don't want to let uh, illegal immigrants or any humanitarian crisis, as Rachel Maddow and Joy and Reed would call it, uh, you know, let, let, globalists flood our nation with with labor. I mean, that's just, first of all, black and brown people all across the country should be offended by it on face value. But but all of us, all of the working class should be offended by it, not to mention the dangers of, of the fact that now it's not Central Americans. You have Syrian and Egyptian, all these other people from all across the world flooded in through our border and who knows what 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 problems that'll lead to. So we got to deal with the debt, the border, and last but not least, the forever wars. Look, we don't want to defend the empire. We're not European. And, and even furthermore, we're not an empire. We're a republic. We're a nation. We're a country. We don't need to be an empire. And, and so we can't keep getting ourselves caught up in these forever wars. There's a lot of other things to deal with. I mean, I think deconstructing the administrative state is, is a good one, uh, a serious one we need to get done. Um, and there are a lot of other things that we should be looking to do as well. Cleaning up our elections, of course. Just in 2016, it was okay to say the elections had tampering. In 2020, all of a sudden, it's not okay to say anymore. So uh, there's a lot of things to do. But those three issues, I think, help identify real America First candidates, the, the debt, the border, and the forever wars. 
And what do you tell people who uh, you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation who believe that the answers are in the federal government, from the federal government, and from the expansion of the federal government? How, how do you get them onto your boat? Well, I take them back to, to May of, of 2020 when, when George Floyd was killed out here in Minneapolis. I, I helped lead these protests, most of which I led to the Federal Reserve because I, I tried to tell people in the community that economic imperialism and economic tyranny is the real enemy. Follow the money. Something that we all used to be on board with, that, that the money was mm. kind of mm-hmm. leaned towards corruption. Um, and, and the number one chant I heard out on the streets when George Floyd was killed was, the whole system is guilty, right? The whole system is guilty. Mm. Uh, kind of a, a total indictment of, of, our, of our system here in America. And in many ways, that's true. There's a lot of corruption. It's widespread. I, I would agree that there's a there's a certain truth to saying that the whole system has has corruption, has a rot to it. Well, if you believe that, if you believe the whole system is guilty, you can't justify expanding the system. Those two things don't work together. Mm. You you can't say that the federal government is is inherently racist or or white supremacist or 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 what or fascist or or whatever you want to say. And then turn around and say, let's expand the federal government into infinity. Uh, and, and these are just basic things right. I think uh, people in the inner cities are starting to understand uh, slowly but surely. And, and that the, this swell of the federal government, this outgrowth of, of a grandiose federal government is, is going to undermine the value of their citizenship. They, they get it. They're starting to and, understand. And it- it doesn't seem to have, it doesn't seem to, I mean, if history is a, a teacher, there's, what have they derived from this federal government? Uh, you know, I don't understand where the enthusiasm comes from. $10 loaves of bread, um, you know, sending $180, $180 billion <clears throat> to the Ukraine. Um, you know, it, it, I, I don't know, I don't know what they think they get from it. Um, I guess, you know, welfare, I think they, I think they believe Here's what I think people really believe. And this is a good pitch from, from our, our globalist elite. I think people really believe that once the technology reaches a certain level, then they'll be able to fulfill all the promises that they've made. I think that's part of the sales pitch. And, and I'm just here to tell people, once they reach a level with the technology that they claim they can, it's not going to be friendly. What would make you think that the guilty, corrupt, tyrannical system that you criticize in the streets is going to be friendly the more advanced the technology gets. Universal basic income, for example. Um, all of us in the black community remember, or at least black men remember, and we testify how at a certain era in this country's history, they made welfare and the breakup of the nuclear family contingent upon one another. And so when you go to universal basic income, yeah. what other rights do you think they're going to make contingent upon your, your submission to whatever they say you need to do? Um, they're going to tell you, hey, you're on the teat. If you don't do what we say, uh, you're not going to get your monthly stipend. I mean, that's not a way you want to live. No. And it's, of course, it keeps them incumbent or sort of dependent in such a way that they can continue to extract votes and support politically and all that nonsense. And I, I'm glad you are, are going out publicly and talking about the breakup of the nuclear family because that, that is just in evidence. That is just the fact of what what they did, and talk about you know corrupt system and failing people. I mean that that's example number one, and I'm sure, certain there are plenty of others. I worry that people then go, well, dismantle the whole thing. That that never goes well ever. You need, do not to be right. need to be a deep student of history to know that when you destroy everything, it takes. Hundreds of years, if it is ever going to re- repair itself, and remind ourselves that even in this country, the reason there was a revolution, there were already existing British institutions at every level, local practice of democracy. This was a very evolved society that just shifted its uh, sort of uh, locus of control, essentially, uh, and formed a more formal union amongst the states. It's you know, it, it's not a complete destruction of everything in the society by any stretch. That has never gone well. No, we don't. We don't need a complete deconstruction or or, or, or destruction of uh, of of our entire system. We just need people yeah. who are genuine and honest and real leaders to step up and and have some sacred honor. Be honest. You know that that's really what we need. We don't need to throw out the entire system. We just need 
people not to lie ad nauseum in positions of power. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, you're using a, and, and you're actually a living example of a lot of things that we need dignity, brave, these, these sorts of basic virtues that really we've sort of lost track of. And, uh, I, and I thank you for sort of holding them up for, for, um, to follow uh, and also for, for uh, examination. It's time for us to be virtuous, to follow virtuous intent, to get together. There's just no reason to be so separate. I, I'm guessing somebody gets something out of it because uh, they certainly keep keep driving the wedges wherever they can. Uh, Royce, anything else you'd like to tell people about your campaign before we wrap up? Um, yeah, you can go to RoyceWhite.us and, and you can also follow the podcast. The, the, the podcast website is FreePeopleRadio.com. You can find out more about where to watch and listen. Uh, and, and to sum up my, my point about division is, that, you know, the, the scheme is pit black versus white, make off with the green. That's kind of the blueprint. So I hope we can, uh, we can continue to wake people yeah. up. I think things are going in the right direction in the country. I'm excited and I'm happy to be a part of it. Happy to serve the people. Royce, whatever we can do to help you, please let me know, okay? Thank you, brother. Godspeed. Royce White. Thank you much, sir. Royce White, if you guys are in Minnesota, there's your candidate. Check it out. Uh, I am watching you all on... Uh, somebody's saying that we should check Viva Fry's interview out today. Uh, <laughs> interesting. Uh, there's a lot of stuff flying around. I, I feel like some of... The, I, I don't know if you've all noticed this, but I felt like social media today was uh, sp particularly uh, on fire for some reason. I, I'm not... Not sure what's happening. I, I worry that because people are starting to wake up and speech is starting to be spoken and we're starting to see people do things like speak, speak, speak truth to power, which is the media primarily, that they're starting to really fight back. And that is kind of lighten things up, I think, uh, on, uh, on various uh, social media platforms. Uh, but let me, let me, uh, Caleb, is um, Paul Alexander here yet? I want to, if not, not I want to get on some of the, Platforms. I don't see him okay, back. He'll be there in a second. Okay. Uh, a lot of, again, let me sort of, sort of set up what we're going to talk about with Paul Alexander, which is some of these subtleties on uh, the use of vaccines and medication. Uh, IED, which I loved uh, what uh, Jay Hep, this is on the Rumble Rants, asked him if it stood for. Pretty funny, my friends. Um, look, Paxlovid, Moldupiravir, Peter McCullough has those in his treatment protocols, okay? He uses these medication. I use these medication. We are physicians. We must try to use the best therapeutic with the least risk, given the circumstance, for a given patient in front of us. And we will use whatever we have to use to do the best we can for our patients. We are entitled to use off-label medication whenever we wish. We are entitled to do whatever it is we think is in the best interest of the patient. And again, I'll, again, Peter McCullough, who we spoke to yesterday, was very clear that he used monoclonal antibodies, he used injectable monoclonals, he used Paxlovid, he used, a mold, uses molnupiravir. That's what we do. We use what we have available that is best for a given case, given the risk. Now, I certainly wouldn't use some of these pharmaceutical agents on a 20-year-old male with moderate COVID. I wouldn't do that, nor would I recommend he get boosted. Now, an 85-year-old with a list of medical problems, IED, that you've never even heard of, I might be encouraging them to do everything we possibly can to protect them, not only because there, I understand there's risk, but if there is some benefit, it becomes worth that risk. For instance, I use the RSV vaccine. How come you guys haven't been freaking out about the RSV vaccine? Do you even know what these things are? Of course you don't. So you, you are no business to be any more than centralized authority in medicine is making decisions for what doctors and patients do together. You know, it's interesting when I, uh, if you remember all the way back to when Joe Rogan talked about what he and his physician did, where he took uh, monoclonal antibody, he took ivermectin, he took, uh, he took, um, DM, what is it called? The uh, antioxidant, N NAD. He took NAD, two infusions of NAD, IV, okay? Of all the things that he received, the only weird thing was the NAD infusion. 
And yet because people, the press, don't know enough to know that that was the outlying elements in his treatment, it was not even brought up. There just was the I word in there, so they had to go crazy about that. And of course, as we pointed out repeatedly, that's a harmless medication that the CDC itself requires people to take for five days if they are immigrating from many different country, countries seeking asylum here. It's an inert medication. Uh, I've never seen any real side effects. I've seen a little GI, something, something, but it's been using it for years and years and years. Uh, not on horses. I've been using it on humans. So, uh, Caleb, just let me know when Paul comes in. You can throw that up on the screen, okay? Uh, yes, he's logging oh, Caleb in. Caleb must uh, be setting him up here. Right now, okay. I'm getting him in. Uh, let me see what you guys see. Uh, you guys aren't commenting now. Uh, oh, wait, here we are. Let me get you guys' comments on the Rumble rant. Uh, NAC is different. Uh, it's uh, NAD, and it's an intravenous. You can get an in, You can get nicotinamide riboside, which is a congener, an oral congener of NAD that I think is actually a good product. I've been taking it for many, many years to sort of, it, you know, there's a lot of emphasis right now on mitochondrial health and the oxidative state of our mitochondria and of our cells generally. And when people talk about inflammation, that is a big piece of what they're talking about. And so from a biological standpoint, from a chemistry standpoint, I, I am looking carefully at things um, like NAD and, and, and NR in terms of trying to improve that. It would reduce aging theoretically. All right. Uh, over to the rumble. I'm sorry, over to the restream. Uh, yeah, I'm a horse doctor. Thank you, Tom Cigars. Uh, wasn't mandated. Yeah, the thing I would take issue with, if you guys want to take issue with something, let's take issue with mandates. Mandates to me were absolutely unconscionable. It's why Aaron Cariotti brought up and just raised his hand and said, you do not have the bioethical justification to mandate people going to college take a vaccine of this nature, given the risk reward. He was summarily dismissed from his job as a decorated professor of psychiatry and as the head of their bioethics department. Please welcome Dr. Paul Alexander. Paul, we're just sort of setting up uh, our conversation. As you mentioned before you got here, uh, this is going to be a big interview, so I will kind of let you um, pick up the, the uh, baton here and uh, talk about uh, wh where shall we start? Where would you like to start? Uh oh, we don't I have need, your, hang on, we don't have your sound. Uh, you got to you're, you're muted again. We this was the, whatever that problem what was, was that? we had a few minutes. Oh. There you are. How was that? There you are. Perfect. Okay, yeah. so look, um, are we being taped? Yeah, we're, we're live, we're live and we're being taped. Both, both, tape but and look, live. Here, here's the bottom line. The bottom line is after our last interview, globally, I mean, I've got responses from so many different quarters across the world. A lot of technical people, lay persons, everyone loved it. They follow you and um, they just found the interviews very balanced and um, just well delivered. But it, there, are some, there are some folk out there in media um, who have raised some questions and they've begun to bang away and um, raise some questions on TWC and uh, a statement that you had made, something to do with... Um, they wanted us to clarify amnesty and the vaccine. So that's why I said, you know, let's have the opportunity because good people's names are being bandied around. I don't like that. Let's have mm -hmm. the opportunity for Dr. Mm -hmm. Troop to say what he has to say and, and just 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 lay it out there. So I, I wanted to just say, look, I'm Paul. Well, everyone knows me and everyone knows you. We don't have to go to backgrounds again. I'm an evidence-based medicine specialist, scientist. Yes. You are a doctor, Drew, clinician, yes. um, et cetera, medical doctor, scientist. Um, just straight to the point, TWC, um, issues around amnesty and the vaccines. I, I just want to ask it to you in a way that yeah. you yeah. could have the chance to explain it. The way I understand it, but for those who don't understand your position. I want it to be out there because I think you are. I think um, people need to be judged on the arc of their life, their full life, their full yeah. pedigree, everything they've yes. done. You yes. can't just dislike someone. You could if you want, but you're just being insane in the sense that 
I don't like this person. I don't like anyone they speak to or they connected to because they said this in the past. But you don't even understand the whole statement. So let's just clear it right. up. So of course. Tell me when we can go. All right. Let me clear my position up. I'm glad you're here. Glad you're bringing this up. Um, and by the way, it's this is what what pisses what, what pisses me off is it's never what you say. It's always what somebody says you said. Always, whatever goes viral, whatever the trolls chew on, it's always eaten. I mean, you all you need to do is come back and go, would you clarify what is what was it you said? I don't want to get this wrong. No, they effing get it wrong, and then they spin on what's uh, whatever interpretation of what somebody says is rather than the fact of what somebody says. So, would you do you want to interview me or you just want me to go and talk about my yeah, position I, on amnesty me, first? Yeah, I, I, okay. let's do it that way so we can be very tight. I know time is a premium here. So, okay. Yeah, okay. Yes, so let me just say this. My position, so everyone understands, finally, I provide technical scientific <laughs> support to the wellness company, um, TWC.health. Mm -hmm. um, I know the owner, Foster Coulson. I think the wellness company is doing a good job. Everything I know thus far, it's a good company. For me, above board, Foster is a good man. Um, he's helped a lot of scientists, a lot of doctors who were canceled by the traditional system for standing up and speaking out. And a lot of people out there in their mommy's basements, they just have the luxury of doing that. They don't understand the people like me, et cetera, McCullough. At some points, you lose everything. You lose. I lost my academic appointment. I lost two jobs just because I stood up against the lockdowns four years ago, against the vaccines. So they, they just don't know. So yes, I do support TWC. I support many entities and I often work for free. What people don't understand is when they see me, when they see other scientists appear on a stage somewhere, the people are flying you there. Often I drive, often I fly and I pay my own funds and often you get nothing. I've been places where people said, oh, Dr. Alexander, we need you here. I arrived there, 10,000 people there, paid. And then at the end, the host tells me, well, you know, we didn't really bargain. We fell short. I know it's a lie and I have to go away and I have to eat the cost. But my, my battle has been to help save lives if I can, share information, inform and educate. And that's what the fight I'm in. I'm still in the fight and I'll remain in the fight. I support TWC. If I know anything about TWC that's on toward, I would not be with them. For me to be with them, I stand with a good organization. Thank you. So, Dr. Ju, what's your position on TWC? Oh, I, I have the exact same position. And, and I would even add to that that it's because of people like you that I'm uh, that much more comfortable being a part of it. I, I am paid by them. I do support them medically. Uh, I do advise them scientifically. And I, it's just been nothing but a great experience in terms of getting to empower patients. We, we have a lot of things planned and they are extremely yes. creative and extremely good at executing. So patients can spend less money, they can have less hassle, that they can have access to care that they should easily get. It, we, we have an antiquated system that is encumbered and expensive and people are... <laughs> It, it reminds me, Paul, I've said this before, of when back, the reason I started on radio back in the day, 1983, is because we had this thing we were fighting. It was called grids, and we were just starting to call it AIDS. And I had an opportunity to go on a radio show, and there was nobody talking to young people, I realized, about not just AIDS, but about sexual health and STDs at all. Or what we call now STIs. And it was considered bizarre to talk to adolescents and young adults about that in 1983 because we'd just been through the 70s, which was a sexual revolution. And the adults that brought that revolution never contemplated what to do or what adolescents might do and what they should do about what adolescents might do. I was 24 years old. I had just been an adolescent. I knew well what they were up to and they needed information and they needed it straight. Now, that was bizarre. I have the same feeling now about access to certain medications and certain um, 
Well, the emergency kit is a great example. It's things that you should have on hand that you yep. should learn how to use, that you should have backup of medical system, but shouldn't have to go to an urgent care or an ER where you are literally paying for everything you see there. Every inch of those rooms, every piece of equipment, every staff member, you pay for that when you walk in those doors for no reason. We have to get people to be smarter and more efficient with their health care and put the control back in their hands. Excellent. And that is TWC.health. All of those bots out there, okay. those down in their mommy's basements who want to just bang away and say, <laughs> oh, you're supporting an organization. So, I'll say it again, TWC.health. Take a look at it. Take some time. Now, Dr. Yeah. Drew, I want to say this. Um, I work for yeah. the Trump administration. I had to sign confidentiality agreements. I'd be in prison. I was informed. If I discuss anything that I saw there, anything that went on there, that I, and a, a president needs executive privilege. That's what people don't understand. Mm. So I could mm -hmm. only say certain things and um, put it this way. I still support Trump. Trump is not a perfect guy. Trump made a lot of mistakes under him. But when I look at the cast of characters today on deck, for me, for me, you can have your own. You don't need to comment on this. You can have your own philosophy and decision. He's the best choice that we have right now to do what needs to be done. I want to put that on the table. That's my decision. Now, amnesty. Okay. A, a, big problem, right, amnesty. a big problem emerged some months ago when Dr. Emily Oster wrote a piece, I think it was in the Atlantic, saying that, you know what, um, you know, we should, we should just try and forgive people who made mistakes and move on. Now, back mm. then and still mm. today, so I want to give you my position and I want you to have the opportunity to say yours. And I'll say it this way. Yeah. I love everyone to have their own position. I'm not going to change how I feel about you after. That's your opinion. My position on amnesty is this. I feel that the kind of scholarship and science that I, Atlas, Rich, Osqui, Tenenbaum, Ladapo, we were working together. We were printing and publishing. We spoke for four years every day in interviews. And we gave CDC, Han at FDA, every piece of information about lockdown, Burks, Fauci. I was fighting them from inside of the government. Yet they still locked mm. us down. They hardened the lockdowns and people died. Children died because of the school mm. closures. Business owners died because of the business closures. So I have been clear. I want no amnesty. I could forgive somebody so I could let it go so it doesn't eat me up because it's eat me up that people did such wrong. The science was bulletproof two weeks out that lockdowns were hurting people, hurting people, yet they continued. So I, I, I still have my position. What is your position on amnesty? My position is that I thoroughly support and understand your position, and I understand why you would say what you do. What I, what I said when we discussed this last time was, I fear that if mm -hmm. we take too an aggressive a uh, measure, too aggressive a position towards some sort of punitive intervention for these gr grotesque mistakes, uh, that we will never get to the truth. That then all these perpetrators will sink into their foxholes and their legal teams, and God only knows what escape measures will be, you know, sort of attempted. And years and years and years will go into a legal battle rather than a shorter period of time dedicated to figuring out what happened for, for, for real, for, like really getting to the bottom of this where we all agree what happened here? What did we do wrong? And what do we have to do to be sure it doesn't happen again? So my position is purely pragmatic. So I'm, I am putting pragmatism ahead of your moral argument, which you could argue is not okay. I, I'm perfectly open to that idea. My argument is purely pragmatic, purely. My priority is getting to the bottom. I need we need to find out what happens. Now, I would like these people ridiculed and held fully accountable in the court of public opinion, for sure, Like and, and hopefully lose jobs and other things like they'll happen to the rest of us who dare to speak up and speak the truth. I hope that all happens. But in terms of taking like a Nuremberg 2.0 and all this, 
it, it, we're going to lose we're, our opportunity to figure up. We may, I'm not saying necessarily, we may lose our opportunity to figure out what happened. And that, that from a priority, pragmatic standpoint, I, I, can't, I can't sit with that. So that's me. Okay, so, you know, just to finish on this point, because we're going to end on vaccines. Look, Atlas, Scott, I knew him. I worked there at the administration. He was in Eisenhower. I was in HHS. Jay Bhattacharya, I know him well, too. Good man. Martin Kuldorf, excellent man, parent. I know these people personally. Personally, I've, I've been to Dr. Woods's home with them for retreats. Um, really hard study trying to figure out things that went wrong. I don't want to get into too much personal issue, but I'm just saying this. They testified recently, and I, and I watched Scott. I watched Jay. I watched Kuldorf. More Scott on Jay, and they were saying, you know, let's not point fingers. Let's just, um, maybe we should just move on and stuff. And that was a message. Immediately, I responded with my own blog and people who turned to me and say, Paul, what kind of craziness is this? And that's where I reiterated my point. And people said, well, listen, we need you to get Dr. Drew to articulate his position. And what I like about what you just said, which I didn't hear before, is the fact that you are saying, look, let's move on. Yet you also leave the door there to say that if people could have be held accountable too. So you trying to tread a needle, but oh, you're trying I, I to I am say, not. I just were clear. I am not saying let's just move on and kumbaya at all. I don't want that. I do not want. There's no way. Uh, so to be clear, I am angry. I want. I want young people to be angry at what they did to them. They need to never forget this. People need to be. <laughs> properly uh you know again i don't want to be too dramatic with this because i want to be able to get to the bottom of it that's the bottom line here yes, but yes. i do I not just move along forget about it look the other way that is not my opinion that is not my opinion good so now to vaccine so listen i wrote this big piece for brownstone um uh, about two years ago just after the vaccines came out because we were seeing a lot of negative efficacy we were seeing that the um the uh the immunity was waning rapidly, um, and we actually mm -hmm. began to see harms accumulating rapidly. So persons like myself stood up and said, no, no, hold on. Put a stop to these vaccines in total. Across the board, you go back to the lab and study it. In fact, my view, my view from day one, Dr. Drew, is this. Is this. I, I have been in, in the camp that said, do nothing. I said, let us do nothing in society. No lockdowns, no school closures, no business closures, nothing. Not even mass mandates. Properly protect the vulnerable in our society. You know who granny is? 8085 with underlying medical conditions. Deal with granny. Make reasonable, sensible precautions. But leave the rest of society alone. Don't touch them. The society will front face pathogen, as we always do. We will become exposed naturally and harmlessly. And we will develop natural immunity, we'll recover, and we will move towards herd immunity. That is how we deal with pathogen epidemics, pandemics, if there are these pandemics now. So my position has been bulletproof. I didn't want them. And I have to be honest and tell you that I had discussions in the Trump administration with high-level officials who was just met in Operation Warp Speed. And I said, my position is none. No vaccines. Um, and then I was saying, you know what, if you could make the case that at that point, we didn't even know what was going on. I said, look, if you could make the case that very sick elderly people, very sick elderly people, highest risk persons, let them be properly informed, proper informed consent, weigh the benefits versus the harms. Let them decide. Do not mandate. Never offer it. Never mandate. Just offer it. That was it. And then I even changed rapidly and said, no vaccine across the board. We ran into a firestorm the other day and I wanted you, and we're going to end now because this is all I wanted to talk about, where mm. some people started to write and talk in the media. Well, Dr. Drew was against, was for vaccines. Then he was against. Then we think Dr. Drew said that he might give elderly people if they ask. Let me ask you something, Dr. Joe, because this is a very important point, and I want to be very mm. straightforward I'm asking it. I come from the School of Evidence-Based Medicine, which I think killed itself in COVID. 
EBM right now is dead, but I'm a purist EBM practitioner. And part of my area of expertise is in, is in an area, a very niche area called values and preferences. And we actually are studying patient values and preferences. And we got to the point where clinicians must take the patient, must take the patient views and values into account in their clinical encounter with them. Mm -hmm. Not just extra teacher and say, my decision is you must do this and the patient has no say. Oh, yeah. Because if a oh, patient, yeah. right. For sure. So when you sure. said what you said, Dr. Drew, were you from the point of view that if my elderly patient, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's how I understood it, but it seemed there was a little firestorm. But did you mean that if your elderly patient came to you and you sat them down and you went through a benefits versus harms assessment and you laid yes. it out to them yes. and yes. they were informed, properly consented, and then they say, you know, Dr. Drew, you just told me this vaccine could give me myocarditis, possibly pericarditis, paralysis, Guillain-Barre, I might have dissecting the aneurysms, all sorts of crap. Yet I'm 85. I want this damn vaccine. I don't care what you say. Is that what you meant? Yeah. I, 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 uh, yes, that is what I meant. But let, let me uh, tell you exactly what I did. So there's yes, no, please, no, absolutely please. no contrast about it. Uh, a, a, we, we had this latest booster is the clearest example of what you're talking about for me because things were so clear. I sat patients down and I said, I just recently as yesterday <laughs> had this conversation with a patient. I said, well, look, uh, this vaccine was designed for a variant that we are at least four variants downstream from, maybe more. It. Uh, oh, by the way, let me let me tell you. I, I specifically had it with a patient yesterday who just had COVID, and he wanted to take the vaccine. And I said, "Look, the nucleo, you you have a much more robust reaction from the COVID you just had than anything a vaccine is going to do." But I could boost it with the vaccine. I don't think so. I don't. There's no actual evidence of that that has ever been documented that somebody three months post covid who takes a booster is somehow protected more from severe illness than just the natural immunity itself no you're fine right. as you are you don't need this booster and this booster is from a variant four at least four variants ago maybe more so i what i and the words i use when i tell the patients this I, i'll say to them i don't know what we're doing I don't know what this is anymore. I don't know what how, how to, t this is the landscape. And there are, as you mentioned, there's potential side effects. We're very worried about these things. And, you know, we may yet discover there's worse, worse things ahead. But I, haven't, I can't yes. even begin to tell you why I would boost because there's no evidence for, for me to do so. So I don't know what we're doing. Now, that yeah. kind of conversation I've had many, 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 many times, I would say... Two patients went ahead and got the booster anyway. And I'm not really clear why they did, except they, they, would, they would say things like, um, I had not had COVID so far. I feel like the vaccine protected me. And I had zero reaction to the vaccine. So thank you, Dr. Pinsky, but I'm going to go get the vaccine. What am I going to do? Am I going to drive them off the road to make sure they don't go to the pharmacy and get the vaccine? I mean, this is their prerogative. Most of the people that we're taking issue with us are interested in medical freedom. That's part of the part of medical yes. freedom is giving the patients what they need yes. to make a proper decision. The, the, the nuance in my world, Paul, and I, I know you probably study this, yes. is to make sure, A, that I've done it properly, that I really did it accurately and properly. But B, and the more difficult thing, is to make sure the patient heard and understood everything I was telling them and could process it. Yes. So I will spend time doing that and also give them opportunity yeah. to respond to, you know, if there's any questions, anything like that. And to you know, come back with more questions. Email me. Here's my email address if you're still contemplating this. That's how I approach this. And the idea that, think about how screwed up it is that a mandate gets in the middle of all of that so none of that happens. Think about that. None of that happens if there's a mandate. It's the opposite of the practice of medicine. Yeah. It's the opposite uh, of the evidence basis that you, that you stand for. Well, Dr. Drew, the thing is, there was no basis, medical, scientific, any basis for a vaccine mandate because we know very quickly, we knew that this vaccine was non-sterilizing. It moved from having neutralizing antibodies and it did not stop infection or transmission. 
if a vaccine does not stop transmission, does not cut the chain of transmission, it's moot. It's dead. You cannot mandate that. And, that and, was wrong. Right. That was yep. wrong. I, I, no. I agree. The mandates were wrong. I agree. The mandates were wrong. Agree. So and, I'm you know, by the way, I, I just before. Go ahead. Finish. Finish your thought, Paul. No, I was trying to explain some people trying to explain. on the Twitter, Twitter, back, 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 sub stack and stuff and say, look, what happens if a parent. And this is the conundrum that a clinician like yourself is in. Parent comes in to see you. Their child is gravely ill, has some advanced cardiovascular renal failure. You, are, you counsel mm. them and say, you mm. know what? This vaccine looks like it has problems for, for, for men, young men. And they, they, they say this child was 14. Young men between 14 to 24, massive increase in mm. myocarditis risk. I don't think this is for you. Parents say, listen, my child is sick, kind of mortally and is potentially dying. I want to try anything. I want to give them the shot. I don't care what you say. Yeah, I understand what you just told me about all those risks. I want to place value on accepting that excess risk for the modest even benefit that it provides. What would Dr. Judo say? Look, I am still not going to give you the shot. What the patient? The patient going to just get up, walk out your office, and yeah, go to yeah. another doctor who's right. the shot. So, so you're yeah. not you know really and, difficult and situation. Well, and by the way, you know, there, there are backups in, in a hospital setting. There are ethics committees, right? So you can put it before a committee and go, hey, I have an ethical dilemma. What do, what do we do here? Uh, and that's where my head goes immediately in a situation like that. Like, we got a problem here. We gotta, I, need, I, need, I need backup. And I'd certainly get consultation and consensus. And, you know, this is how it's done. But we aren't allowed to do it when there's a mandate. You just, it's, you know, I was going to tell you that, that just before COVID break out, broke out, I interviewed a guy named Larry Brilliant. And Dr. Brilliant was the world's expert on smallpox. And he's, I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was before COVID, but he said to me, he goes, look, you don't need lockdowns during a massive exposure of a serious pathogen. People naturally pull away from each other. They naturally do what, what's reasonable for protecting themselves. You don't have to shut the world down. People accommodate these situations uh, quite, quite readily if you give them the proper information. And the really, you know, is this conversation you and I are having, really, I think about what's at the core of this. You know, you said if, if people knew the vaccine, you know, wasn't as effective as they suspected and didn't prevent transmission and stuff. Yeah, if people knew. It took them, think how long it took them to get that information out even when they knew that that is again, that's where the moral issue starts to come into focus again. Yeah, well, you know, Doctor Drew, I am. Um, I wanted the chance to speak to you because I mean, the the the, the fact of the matter is that these, these are these these COVID vaccines have <laughs> have really presented a challenge now, and um, I yeah. think um, the public the public will not. I think. One thing here that we have really discussed is the issue of informed consent. Really and truly, informed mm -hmm. consent was not given to mm -hmm. people across the world Correct. throughout this vaccine Correct. program. Because had you, Correct. yeah, and the fact is, had you given people the information, the proper benefits versus harms in a proper informed consent discussion, many yep. people would have yep. probably not taken it. That's the issue. Yep. So, so I think yes. that was a glaring. John, a John glaring you know, theory. John John Campbell, you know, the the nurse in the UK who has been doing these very useful videos. He said that he goes, if he just had known about the DNA contamination, he wouldn't have taken the vaccine. Just that for him was the a thing, a piece of information that would, if he had somebody provided it to him, he would have chosen otherwise. But there, but there, you know, the the now we're getting into the court case, right? You know, how do we? Who knew what when? And I didn't know. Oh God. You know, I, I just want us to get to the bottom of this and not do this ever again. We, we need to really get serious about our systems and how they work. And because uh, stuff will come along and we just cannot, cannot. I, particularly, as you said, when, when you've got the Davos, uh, you know, sort of uh, planning the next centralized uh, rollout of how you should live your life. People should be alarmed. They should be alarmed. Yeah, Ooh, very long. So, Dr. That Drew, is me. I have off? to. Yeah. You have to. Let's yeah. close off tonight. Uh, is there any, 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 um, anything you want to say at the end of this? I mean, to say that you know we've closed off that firestorm. And uh, look, I, I am glad that you made yourself available, and that uh, we could have had the additional conversation. 
Because I think the key, sir, is that in this battle, we have to keep informing and educating and sharing. And I may not agree with everything yes. you say. You may not agree with everything I say. Yeah. But I think fundamentally right. it comes from a good. We're trying to save lives. However we get to the end of the road, we're trying to get there. And we're not dealing with nefarious yeah. people. That's the most important no. thing. You know, we, yeah. are, we are good people. We're trying to... Even those people in Twitter and all of those places, everybody is just angry right now. I, I just want people to calm down and let's just listen, try to understand and share and, and step up if you could. But let's not let's stop this burning each other down and smearing and slandering and stuff like that. It is, it's not a, we don't need that in 2024. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I just, you know, interviewed Royce White, whose, you know, primary message is don't let people divide us. So, Dr. Paul Alexander, again, Dr. Dr. Paul Alexander com. Thank you, sir. I'll talk to you soon, no doubt. And uh, the, one, the one other thing I, I would wish for is, please, everybody, when you think you've heard something say something, go either listen to the tape or go ask that person. We have social media where you can ask people, you can DM them, you can do all kinds of things. Now, these, as you see, these take a long time to explicate the, the, the actual detail of our decision-making and how this works. So it may not be appropriate for just a simple response on X or a, a DM on, on uh, Instagram or something, but go listen to it and don't, don't pair it what somebody else says. What somebody else says is what somebody else said. Not the subject you're trying to look at. And listen, and if you if you think that person said something that you don't like and you're going to interpret, go look at when they've talked about these things elsewhere to make sure you're not getting it wrong. Because you should be disgusted when you go after people and you're wrong. That should be a disgust. You should be ashamed and disgusted whenever you find yourself in that position. I know I, you know, if I accuse somebody of something that is isn't not what they actually said, I feel terrible, terrible. It's just, and you should feel that way too. But people just move right on to the next thing. So please keep the conversation going. Uh, I actually have to run right now. This one coming up here. Uh, Latipo is actually coming in here soon. Roseanne's coming in. Alex Berenson, Dr. Kelly Victory coming back on Valentine's Day, everybody. Uh, I know there's been a lot of, again, S silly, silly uh, uh, sort of wheel spinning around Dr. Victory. She'll be back to speak for herself. And stay with us. I'll be back again, I think Tuesday is our next show with uh, Z Van Fleet. Is that correct, uh, Caleb? I, yes. Yeah, that's correct. Well, Tuesday at 3 check. Pacific. It's Three o'clock. And all the, we're only on Tuesday and Wednesday next week. Is that correct? Yes. We have to go to Florida Possibly. for something? It's possible yeah. that Doug Stanhope is on the schedule for Wednesday. I just haven't double checked that, but I think that's who's coming on Wednesday. Oh, the twenty. That's the great Doug Stanhope. Everybody, you want to have fun? See us here on Wednesday, but we'll, we'll see you next Thursday, at three o'clock. Excuse me, Tuesday at three o'clock. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com help.